I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everybody, Lloyd Lober here, co-founder of Boast AI and Traction Cough. Super stoked for today's session. Today's speaker, John Hall, came highly recommended by two of our past speakers, Eli Schwartz, who, ta who talked about uh, SEO, and then Eric Huberman, who's the CEO of Hawk Media a few weeks ago. So I'm super excited to have John here. John's a co-founder and president of Calendar, a leading scheduling app. He's also a serial entrepreneur. He authored the best-selling book, Top of Mind. And John, without further ado, I'll let you take it away. All right. So thanks for having me, Lloyd. Uh, obviously, um, you know, I speak a lot in different, well, speak typically in person a lot, but we're getting used to virtual. But uh, what's nice about virtual is that, um, you know, I, I really do actually want to provide value when I speak. You can do a lot in person, but when you're virtual like this, uh, I want to keep things as real as possible. So my first rule is let's keep things real. And so what I mean by that is I mean like I'll put my email at the end of this. I try to make myself available after speeches just because there's only so much you can do in a 30 to you know hour, hour span. And so uh, that's my first rule and uh, stick with that with any speech. So feel free to reach out if you think I can be helpful at all. So the, one of the big things with understanding this idea set behind top of mind. And so what I mean by top of mind is how you engage people consistently so that you're making the most out of your time and that you're in, engaging people in really good ways. And so um, there's a, a term that I use very frequently card, called ROIT, and that's the return on investment of our time. A lot of people are like, okay, well, when I think about investment, I only think of money. I think of um, you know how much dollars we're spending, but one of the most valuable things that we have when we're we're spending something or or an asset we have is our time, and so um, a big part of me speaking to people is about how you get to understand more on how you can use that better, and also how you can engage people um, so that you get more return on that investment. So here's some of the things that um, you know, that I'll be talking about today: being more resourceful, courageous, strategically aligning efforts, uh, relationships, and trust. So those are more that's general, but I'll talk about a few kind of hacks and habits that work really well. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is the self awareness of your time. So. What I mean by being resourceful or courageous is a lot of times our brains just aren't trained to be truly resourceful. And so when you look at um, you know, this picture, A is a very common thing that we have. It's a, you're on an island, help. I've seen this on a movie before. I've seen other people do it. Um, B is, is what I wanna train people to do. I want people to think differently. And I wanna really challenge everybody as a takeaway to think differently. Like challenge yourself that anytime you're looking at doing something, it's not what did someone do? Uh, now you can look at that and you can say, hey, what did someone do? Um, well, and how can I do it better uh, or, or situational? Like for example, with content, a lot of times people think when you create content, everything's so general or so, uh, or so um, uh, creative and, and uh, original. Um, one of the top posts on Forbes ever was an article that was actually found on Lifehack. And this woman just took it and made it a little unique to being on Forbes. And it got like 20 million views um, in, in days. And so uh, I don't want you to think that you have to always come up with some crazy original, but always be thinking of if someone is doing something, how can I do it differently? How can I, how can I think differently about this? So moving into that, um, I'll play this video. This is something that always reminds me of, of how, to, uh, how to think differently or how to think about uh, different styles of uh, marketing and, and tactics. Ship my pants right here. Ship my pants, you're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I just shipped my pants and it's very convenient. Very convenient. I just shipped my drawers. I just shipped my nightie. I just shipped my bed. If you can't find what you're looking for in store, we'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. So what, I don't know if audio worked there because we didn't test the audio recordings, but uh, if, it, if it is, uh, or with that uh, video, I don't know if you guys remember this, but this is something that I, I look at about it once every six months because uh, it, 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 it's a reminder of, um, uh, this was one of the most successful advertisements in a year 
uh, that was put on by Kmart. This was years ago. I mean, it was probably 15 or 20 years ago, um, but it was called Ship My Pants. And um, you could imagine when, you know, the, actually I was, I was blessed to meet the people who came up with this like a while ago. And I ran into a couple of people on that team and they said how hard it was to get people to buy into this idea. When they first brought it up, the ship my pants idea, that's what these, these people just came ship my pants, ship my pants. It's, it's a crazy idea for, for Kmart to do. And so I, when I think about that video and I encourage you guys to, to, you can just easily get on YouTube and, you know, watch it occasionally because it reminds me of these two courageous marketers were so thought, they, they were so courageous to be like, hey, we're going to persevere through people telling us this is crazy, this is a dumb idea. And they ended up uh, forming the idea, working out, and it ended up just rocking out. It did so well. And so I, I try to tell people is that, you know, the, the things that I see work all the time to really like stand in someone's memory, whether it be through sales, marketing, or, uh, you know, just being more memorable to people is when there is something different. So I'll give you an example. And uh, this is actually um, comes up a lot where, um, and this is a good takeaway to, to really challenge yourself to write different emails, to correspond differently. So um, I had a situation where there was a guy who I went out to this nice dinner with, we talked about having this big partner uh, ship and we were like, hey, we're gonna create, you know, these companies are gonna do business together, these companies are gonna do business together and crickets afterwards. So you could imagine is that like, it's almost like that ghosting feeling where in business, uh, this happens a lot where we go and we feel like we're so connected to someone and then all of a sudden crickets. So after 13 emails, I didn't hear back 14. It, it was several calls. Didn't hear back. I was just ghosted. And so then I sent this email it says after quite a few emails, I thought I'd share with you my bucket list this year in an effort to get a call set up. John's bucket list, have a sit down with Justin Bieber about where his life is going play NBA Jam with Oprah, watch The Notebook Without Crying, um, get a call set up with Blank before 2016. Uh, I don't think one, two, three are going to be a problem, but four is the only one that worries me. Could you help out with this? So this is an old example that I love using. I've been using it for a couple years now, um, but it was extremely effective. The guy got back to me and it was like 13 or 14, it was 13 minutes, I think he got back to me. And he's like, you know what? Like, and I, and I, and I ended up, we, we, st we still are actually partners to this day, but um, he ended up telling me, he's like, he's like, dude, like, I, I just forgot about like hanging out and like all that business talk that we had. And, um, and he's like, then when I saw the personal email and like joking around, I remember the personality and things. And it reminded me that we had that kind of friendly informal relationship. Um, and so that's an example of when you're communicating with people, just think differently. Now, I'm not saying do crazy emails. Don't go and get me in trouble and say, hey, I saw the, this hall guy talk and he tells me to write just crazy shit in emails. Uh, that's not the case that I'm trying to get. What I'm trying to think it would do is challenge and get really clear examples that you're like, wow, that's really unique. Um, so that it challenges you to do the same. Strategically aligning efforts is probably one of the bigger things with, with this talk and, and one of the bigger takeaways is that a lot of times when you're trying to um, engage or be more productive uh, with people, it's, it's a, a lot of times somebody on your team is already doing work. They're already accomplishing something and there's something missed in communication. There's something that could have been done better where you could have hit and engaged people uh, better. So for example, like uh, oh, I was just talking to a large brand yesterday where we were, they were trying to get an article to rank for search. They were like, well, we want to rank for, um, for this term. And then I looked and I saw that one of their other departments had done a campaign and was already ranking for the term, but they weren't even talking to each other. They weren't even like communicating. I had to point that out to them because there was no alignment in efforts. They could have easily already got what they wanted just by communicating with this department better. And so what I encourage people to do is feed two birds with one scone. I like saying killing two birds with one scone or one stone, but um, after thinking about it, killing birds doesn't make sense. So we're going to feed them instead here. And the way we do that is by doing just simple templates of let's say like if you go back to school now, granted, I don't, I, I don't necessarily recommend doing a racing matrix. This is exactly the, the, this is the example that's in front of you right here. But um, I can give you a template if you, my email's right on this, um, on this screen. So if you email me, I can actually send you this template and you can make it your own. So like um, the, the point of this is that 
you have tasks and deliverables and things you're up to on one side. Then you actually have the departments and people on the top. And then you categorize now this is racy. So it's, you know, driver, responsible, uh, accountable, support. Um, and so these are its own thing, but identify your own things that you want to say, say, who's in charge? Who should I let know that we're doing this? Who should I say this could be helpful um, to? And I'm telling you, if you start, and this is more of a brain exercise that I love taking people through, because if you actually just map this out, you'll realize that in your everyday, like uh, your efforts that you're doing and others around you, you're gonna realize that what you do affects people significantly. And if you communicate that in the right way, you can do some, you can be so much more productive. You can get a lot more accomplished. Um, you can do pretty much more with less. And so, um, you know, happy, this is a great takeaway. So happy to send you guys a template of this. Um, it's just a spreadsheet that I built uh, out and then you can just make it your own. But that's something that even if you don't implement it and share it with a bunch of people, just having it yourself. So that like, let's say like one of the things on here, uh, publication placement. When something goes live, I know that I'll let PR know, sales know, recruiting know. Now I don't have that labeled here, but when recruiting needs a, you know, and, and something to send to a new recruit, if, if I have an article that I've already placed through my PR division, I can let them know and say, hey, here you go. Here's a recruiting asset for you. So um, just be thinking about all the things that you can have alignment in. And this is a simple thing that I can share with you. This is probably the biggest um, out of all the things that affect um, uh, engagement. It, it's, it's relationships and trust. And like, honestly, it's never been more important. Like right now, uh, those of you who remember, this is actually kind of where, where we're at right now. And um, what I mean by Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber, this is him uh, walking in and seeing Harry um, with his girl, Mary Swanson. So if you've seen Dumb and Dumber, you can remember this. And what he did when there was a lack of trust is he ex -laxed, he exlaxed his best friend. Now, that is a very unusual thing to do. It's not a very smart thing to do. And um, unfortunately, when there's a lack of trust, um, and this is happening all around us right now, you can blame it on um, the, uh, a lot of the challenges that with politics right now, you can blame it on generational differences. You can blame it on not understanding um, people. Um, there's a, there's race, there's gender, there's all these things that are affecting trust. Here, I'm gonna sc scoop past this so you don't have to look at that. But something that I've been really trying to challenge people do, to do is they really have to look at how people are different and how to adjust to how people are going to react with the content that you put out, with how you interact with them. Um, a lot of times you present yourself as someone uh, or, you know, someone on your team or the content you're creating, you're presenting it because you're attracted to it, you like it, but like you have to, you have to spin that around and you have to, uh, what I do, what I tell people and it's in the book, um, it's called uh, content triggering. So when you're content triggering, what you need to do is you need to just sit there and listen and you need to understand who you're dealing with. And whenever there's something that's engaging to someone, um, you, you write that down. Like not maybe at the moment, don't be at the barn, like, oh, that's engaging. I'm going to go write that down. Um, but take note of it. And, and when you get to a chance, write it down. So if, if you're sell, selling somebody something about your product or you're talking to them about something you're up to, um, then simply just, um, you know, remember that or put a note in your phone and then start aggregating that and start paying attention to the things that are engaging to people. And, I, and I'll compare this to like, who has that friend at a party that all, tells the same story like 10 times. It's the, it's the most boring story, but they tell it every time you're around them. Like that's the stuff that people just aren't self-aware of. And you have to teach yourself to be self-aware of what's engaging and what's not. Now, this next video, this is one of my daughter and it's a reminder to me, and this is another good reminder of how we engage people and understand different types of people. Now, my daughter is, you know, she's six now and she's one of the, the most important relationships in my life. And, you know, I'm raising her with my wife. And when we look at the things that she's growing up in, how different it is than what I grew up in, there's a huge differentiating factor in how we, we grow up. We're going to be different no matter how I raise her. And this was a, a point where um, I, I, it reminds me of that different, of the, the of how different we are is that when I was in, in second grade or first grade, I was so excited to have 
my um it was a watch that lit, that lit up it was basically that blue indigo light that would light up on your phone or on your um you're watching it get so excited um you know that it would do it was a timex watch now i was so excited to show my daughter my timex watch and how it lit up and to show her you know how cool that could be and so what she decided to do instead is she decided to try and call grandma so it, it, this is a video with my daughter and you, you, you hear her just basically going, call Grandma Hall, call Grandma Hall. And she gets so frustrated with how she, the watch is not calling Grandma. And so um, from my standpoint, it's wild of how different she is than me, even though I'm raising her and it's just a generational difference. And I need to understand is that people engage, people listen, people are, are raised differently from different backgrounds, from different um, uh, histories, they've had these different experiences. And so it's, it's a goal. If you're going to build trust and relationships, you've got to fully understand that. And a lot of like, I'm in Missouri, there's a lot of people that still don't understand different types of peace, people, races, genders, and, and you got to make sure the people around you're doing better at that, or you're going to have severe issues with engaging people. Tax grandma hall on the next side that's my daughter hopefully you guys can <laughs> hopefully you can hear the audio there but she gets so frustrated all second <laughs> so what i what i tell people to do is is it's this cultivation of a network of helpfulness and it sounds very cheery and cheesy but in reality it's something that a lot of people don't do especially in technology like i, I own a company called calendar.com and um, a lot of times when i'm dealing with people in the tech world they just, it's, it's very selfish. It's very like, it's, it's not this helpful environment. And, um, and I tell people, you've got, you've got to focus on what's truly valuable, what's truly helpful to people. And you'll do, you'll do a lot better. And then also, to be honest, you'll be a lot more motivated. The, the more you kind of enhance the people and the companies around you. Um, we, I was just talking to a company um, that we've been partnering with for a, three or four years now and they just got a huge win for us and I messaged them and I was just like hey thanks like I don't know how we deserve this and their response was hey you've looked out for us for three for years and it's about you know we had to come through big for you and we finally got to so that was like that was this morning and um, I think that for me I've just learned that it's not just about the success that you can bring that you can be more productive um, that you can accomplish a lot more with those relationships, but also it just, it's happy. It, 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 it makes me happy to know that those relationships exist and it motivates me to do better for them and my team. So with this network of helpfulness, there's certain things you can do. So care about their success. The first thing I, this is a t another takeaway is that as uh, one conversation day that, that you're, that you have in the conversation with how can I be helpful? Just simply say, how can I be helpful? How can I look out for your best interests? One, it shows them you care. Two, it changes the relationship from just being professional to actually, you know, personal or informal. Um, but also, you never know how you can help someone. As funny as it is, you mentioned Eric Huberman before this, um, and, and he was a, sp a previous speaker here on, uh, on this. Uh, one, I was actually, one of the reasons why I was late for my tech check is I was actually with Eric Huberman's uh, head of sales, who is in Columbia today, and I was just actually hosting and and showing them a good time because I, I care about Eric and that's an important employee. So I, you know, did stop my day to take to help him out. Secondly, um, it, another thing specifically with Eric is that I was actually recently in, um, you know, I asked uh, his business partner, Tony, what I could do to be helpful. Now this was before COVID um, and I was at an event where he said, oh, well, we're looking for talent in this area. And I think he's, it was like North Dakota. And he was like, there's no way that you would ever, um, you know, know someone there. And it just so happens I ran into a person who was at a larger company in North Dakota that was looking to work with a fast growing awesome company. Um, and you just never know what you're gonna run in. But I had to ask, I asked Tony what I could do to be helpful. Yesterday I asked Eric what I could do to be helpful. It just so happens his salesperson was in town today. He, Eric, Tony did not know I was going to be um, you know, running into this person from North Dakota right after the conversation but you have to ask, you have to understand what's valuable. So that's your first takeaway is ask people, what is truly helpful? How can I, can I look out for your best interests? And then it puts you into places where you can, you can introduce, you can connect people. It makes it so much easier to connect and to advocate for people. Um, a lot of times just showing people that you, you know, they have a, like, for example, somebody has a new book, somebody has a new product, somebody has anything that you know that is important to them. It puts them in a state of vulnerability. 
and you want to be there for that in them in their state of vulnerability. Joey Coleman is an example of a speaker who I have a personal relationship with that when top of mind, my book came out, he bought 25 copies of it or I think more and sent it out to some of his most important relationships and said, this is a good friend of mine and um, I wanna look out for this guy and read his book, it's awesome. That meant so much to me. It kind of changed the relationship with Joey and I. And since then I've helped him out in different ways and um, it's been a really good, um, awesome relationship. He has a great book um, called The First 100 Days um, but, uh, and it's about the beginning of a sale, but that's an example of the things you can do and just naturally put in your day, um, to look out for. And I'm telling you, it has a huge business value, um, on, on what you can accomplish. Uh, next is gifting and recognizing people put a habit together of like, uh, like one of our, our biggest partnerships was LinkedIn early on. And it, ironically, their CEO, Ryan, who's an incredible person, um, I met him earlier on in um, kind of my career because I, we simply were giving feedback for someone who was working under him. And we wrote a letter to um, the, their exec team and Ryan, and we basically talked about how great this, uh, this woman did on a project we were working on and that, you know, we were really impressed and just, we, you know, we'd continue to advocate. Just simply recognizing people in that way and just spending the time like we love bitching at a hotel when we have a bad experience and hitting them up on Yelp because we feel like oh my gosh I've got to teach them something but flip that on the other side is that make a process is that when anybody is doing well for you um, find their boss you know find someone in their team and give them that feedback um, there's been so much opportunity. the idea that the CEO of LinkedIn that relationship started from me just simply giving feedback to someone now I didn't know he was going to be a CEO granted like he was a smart person an awesome human being but like from the standpoint of like back then that was just incredible to have a relationship you know just naturally form and we ended up having a partnership where we were doing a lot of the initial content for LinkedIn uh, when they started doing content on their site and so um, it's, these are just examples and very clear ways that I've seen over time that if you naturally put in your day and you create these habits, uh, good things and benefits and, um, you know, not just outside opportunities, but your team sees this and then they start doing it. Um, one of the reasons why I'm on this call in the first place is just one of the members of my team, Will, who looks out for people all the time. I mean, he, I think he's probably got some of that from, you know, from what we, he's seen me do. And I, and I see him helping people out and motivates me to look out for others. And so um, it, it's definitely a healthy thing and a, a habit that if you're going to truly be on people's mind at the right times in the right moments, you've got to add this to kind of your habits because it's going to mean a lot more and you're going to move from their short-term to long-term memory. And when some opportunity comes up, they're going to think of you first. Uh, the next thing is um, it's more important now than ever. And it's about, it's, it's about education right now. Um, a lot of people, like I, I think every day I hear people are crazy. People are nuts. They're out of their mind. It could, you know, it's a very weird kind of unique world that we're in right now. Um, a lot of the stuff that I see right now is it, it's sparked by a lack of education uh, in people or lack of information. A lot of times uh, there's so much, uh, confrontation that is started by a lack of information and someone if they had information they wouldn't even be pissed and so um, I wanted to give this example and this is a personal example that I give in some of my speeches about uh, this is my uh, or with my wife and and years ago we um, I mean it's crazy to love with a marriage we've been married 11 years and you go up and down in marriage and um, and so what I um, what I always used to ask people is, you know, how can I help you? I, and I still do to this day. I always, you know, say it and was very vocal, but I didn't ask my own wife. And so with her, I asked her, um, I simply just asked her, I said, like, you know, how can I be helpful? Like, and we, let's, let's have like a wine night to actually like talk about this. And so I had this wine night and like that I wanted to improve the relationship. And I said, you know, how can I be helpful? What can I do to look out for you? And she said, I'd love for you to cook more. And I go, geez, out of all the things, all the things in the world I could do, you want me to cook more? And she's like, um, yeah. And I was like, all right, well, cool, I'll do it. Ended up a couple weeks go by, or a week goes by, I didn't do anything. Which a lot of people, when I'm doing speeches in person, I'll ask them like, who thinks, who, who, what did I do? What did I do after that? And people are like, oh, you cooked. Nope, 
didn't do anything. And my wife sent me an article that it was um, from Plated or believe from like one of those kind of styles of our, um, you know, HelloFresh type places. Anyway, um, it was about seven essential tools in the kitchen. So it was essential tools that I need to succeed at doing what she'd asked me. Still a week goes by, I do nothing. Then a week, <laughs> then that next week, uh, she's another article comes and it's what dumb spouses need to learn about the kitchen. Or it was a funny story about how a spouse, when a spouse is uncomfortable in the kitchen, the things that they do. And it, it made me actually laugh, feel more comfortable. And, um, and, it, and I cracked up, um, but it still didn't make me do anything. But then it was a it was a week or two later when we were on our next date night or whatever to have this wine and to look at it helping each other. Uh, she asked me, she goes, how's cooking going? And when that happened, you're like, oh my gosh, like, um, I, I haven't, uh, wait, I haven't cooked. And there's this, this feeling of vulnerability that hits your, your stomach. And this happens with a lot of people you deal with on an everyday basis, but you just don't know. Um, in Office Space, the movie is one of my favorite movies growing up and where the boss asked for the TPS reports and it's just got like this sinking feeling where he's like, where are the TPS reports? And he doesn't have them. And, um, and for me, it was that moment of vulnerability. Um, I mean, a lot of times it even happens with when somebody's like, uh, this happened the other day where somebody was like, why is our, um, it was a friend who called me up and was like, we have to get PR, we have to get PR. And I was like, okay, okay, we, we can hook you up. But I was like, what, what spurred this? And he said, my boss came in and saw this competitor freaking, you know, he got in uh, this publication. Uh, he wanted to always be in there. And so now I'm like, I'm, I'm frantic. I'm crazy. You know, I'm worried. And I'm like, okay, that's, you know, he's a mo moment of vulnerability, but where did he go? He went to me because there was a trust level between us that was formed. So back to my wife's story, when that happened with me, I run to those articles because those were articles, pieces of content um, that, had nurtured, that had nurtured me in a way where I ran to those because that's what I trusted. And so what, we ended, what I ended up at is being basically, well, I actually, to be honest with you, I just hired them. So I hired and had the food, food shipped to me um, and then it was all ready. And then I just threw it in the pan, cooked it you know, quickly. And um, I did it for about a week. And then we had our next date night and I'm do and we're meeting up, we're hanging out and I'm like, hey, I gotta come clean. I'm like, I've been ordering this, you know, this food service. And she goes, oh, oh honey, I, I know. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me out of, like, I thought I was being sweet. No, no, you're, no, you're not. She's like, but in reality, John, you I could have been pissed because I wanted you to do something. I wanted a behavioral change and I could have got you to do it by yelling at you, but Instead, I educated you with content. I found these resources and I figured one, you'd either feel more comfortable and give you the right tools to be set up for success or you just use this, this company. And I was like, you're, so she's like, but this is, isn't this what you do and speak about like content marketing, engaging people. And like, I'm like, you know what? That is what I speak about. And so it's a funny personal example to me because when you see that, like she, that trust level that was formed and that she was able to educate me. And that's why it's like, it's so important to think about all the content that you can create around you that is going to engage people to help them. Cause you never know how that's being used. I ended up being a client. So they got a customer that they can track to that, but also the, how much I've advocated and talked and I've, I've sent those pieces and given those examples. Um, it's nuts what it can do. Um, to engage people. And, and I'm just telling you is that like, the, it's one of the better examples of content marketing and forming trust. And it's through creating engaging content that was valuable to a user that's ultimately could either make them better or come to you. So that's my wife, just so you know, I'm, I'm aware that I married up. That's Yoda. And here's me, just so you can know the proof that I am cooking. So with a very wrinkly apron. All right, and lastly, I'll wrap up here. Um, we're short on time and then we'll do some Q&A. Being aware of how you spend your time is probably the most important thing on this. Uh, just not, uh, well, obviously there's some important things in business that I talk about, but personally. Um, for me, like this is our, the tool that we have, but um, this is my analytics of how I spend my time. So obviously I'm spending 6% of it day drinking during quarantine. It's a problem, scrapbooking with people and you know, uh, I, obviously I can spend my time better, but this was actually a little different, but I just added it just, it, it was interesting to look at this because even like 8% of my meetings were more than an hour. 
that's crazy. Like legitimately for me to pay attention longer than an hour, like it's in virtually impossible. So why is a percentage of my, of my meetings, you know, being, being like that next, then you have like, and I joke around Ryan O, like Ryan O'Connell's a friend of mine. And I was, jo I was joke is that like, if I could spend time with him all day, um, I would, but like, we don't do a lot of business together at this point, but it, it, there's a lot of times I look in my encounters with people because I like them. And I'm not saying that I like Josh, Justin Bieber and Snoop, but those are obviously people I shouldn't be spending too much time with given the industry I'm in. Um, and my wife is down at the bottom, as you can see, which is, is bad as well. Now, when I looked at this and I actually, we were first developing the, school and I, the tool and I looked at it, I realized I'm like, oh my God, one, I'm missing meetings. I'm having long meetings. I'm spending time with people that I don't, <laughs> shouldn't even be spending time with. So when I looked in here, obviously Snoop wasn't there, even though I'd love to kick it with Snoop. But um, there was people that really had no impact on my overall business. I was drawn to them because I liked it, liked hanging. Um, and it, what's an interesting is like, I do love hanging out with my, my wife too, but I wasn't being very deliberate. And so I started time boxing. That's a, a tactic that um, look, type in uh, time boxing in, into uh, Google and you'll see kind of what uh, that means. But it's basically you're blocking off time for specific um, task to get done. And I even use time boxing to um, give myself personal time. So time with hang on with my wife, time to hang out with the kids, time to give myself a mental break. It actually allows you to disconnect when you're needed, when you need to disconnect. So then I started implementing that strategy. And then um, you'll see that now I actually spent less time in meetings. I had some time with wife and kids, which is important relationship for sales. Uh, you'll see that none of my meetings were more than an hour. And so the more self-aware you are, and so uh, the takeaway here is, is first be self-aware. Um, I mean, our tool's free, so you can, do, or initially it's free, so you can just log in and look at the analytics and get, give yourself an idea. And also what I like about it is that it won't actually work well unless you populate your calendar, which people should start populating it because you'll be more self-aware of your time. And obviously you'll see Lindsay's more at the top now and Bieber's at the bottom. So um, I'm in a lot better shape these days and a lot less encounters. So I'll end on and before we go to QA, it's the thing about life, it's precious. And it, I mean, it really each moment's a gift. And so we really have to be very, very like careful on how we can uniquely use our time. So we do everything in, in your power to spend your time the best way possible. And I promise you, you will not only have a lot better luck in business, and, but you'll also just be personally happier. So. I didn't lie. Here is my contact info. That's actually my real email. Um, so it's not going to some admin or anything like that. So you'll get my response. And um, I have a LinkedIn newsletter that I uh, publish about once a week. So feel free to follow that. Um, check out calendar.com. And really, that's that's it. I love your philosophy. It aligns with uh, what we do at Boast as well. And the reason why we helped start Traction Comp and now it's grown into a community of 60,000 founders and we're doing these weekly webinars um, and monthly dinners and the big conference and, and effectively all the profits uh, are donated uh, to Launch Academy, which then goes back into the community. Um, I I'd love to learn, dive in more into some of the businesses you've run. Like what was the first company you started and uh, you know, what has been the culture there like um, over the years and how have you sort of grown that? Oh, I mean, like, honestly, at first, uh, I wouldn't say that I was the best example of understanding culture, because in my 20s, I was starting, I was, uh, I had a, a companies I was starting on the side while I was working for a culture that was not the type of culture I wanted. And, and what was nice about my early 20s, I learned what I didn't want <laughs> in a culture. And I'm telling you, it's like, it's, so important to like and don't get caught up in like hey i'm trying to be super cool or i'm trying to be like like for me it's like having a good culture and being focused on it and being focused around the people around you who you deal business with like that's a part of your legacy in life and i think that a lot of times we forget about legacy because we want to make a quick buck here or that but like doing things right, um, culture and the people around you that, you know, your employees, your, and I, I think culture expands to not just employees, it expands to their employees' spouses, it, it expands to your, uh, your uh, partner, business partners, it um, expands to everybody. And, and I think that for me, my goal is to um, and what I've learned is over time is just to listen, get better, also take, and like for me, taking ownership of like failures, because I used to come up with the craziest culture ideas and think they were really cool. And then like, 
I'd almost like be embarrassed to change it because it was my idea. So I think that, um, you know, we're all faulted in leadership and, and how we set up cultures and how we treat people. And all we can do is just consistently work at it, listen. And so I don't have it figured out yet, but I'm, I'm getting closer and closer as I get older. Definitely. And then um, in terms of staying on top of mind, right? Like there's so many tools out there today. And there's so many things you can do. There's like all these social media channels and, and then there is uh, email, of course, you're getting bombarded by sales development reps and, and phone calls and so on. How does a company, maybe a sales rep or an individual stay on top of mind? Like what are some actions that people can do right away to cut through that noise? I mean, the differentiating factors like, um, like in sales, uh, the other day I sent a cameo to someone or like, uh, and then I like, I, I do all these different things on how I engage people. So I stand, so I stand out. So I would just say, um, in sales, especially when you're in a crowded area, you've got to think really unique on how you're engaging people. Um, a book that I liked is Giftology is written by a really good friend of mine, uh, John Rowland, and he does it through gifting as you, and, and I've, I've used the service too, and it works pretty well where, um, you know, uh, like I'll send someone a nice, like white or a knife to their wife that's personalized to their family. And it'll be like, Hey, just cut me some time later in right here or joking around on getting on their schedule. And so there's all these things you can do to be different. And I think that check the box mentality is very common in sales and you have to get away from check the box mentality. And what I mean by that is that you play the numbers game and you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to do the same thing everybody else is doing. I'm going to, and I think you can play a numbers game. I think in certain companies that I've been involved with, the numbers do work when you, you, when you move through those things quickly, but anytime you get a chance to personalize, do something different. Um, for example, a lot of times people ask me how I got my initial Forbes relationship because I've been writing there for eight years. Well, the first thing that I did was I, I learned as much as I could about that managing editor. Tom Post was the managing editor who I love and care about. We've been, you know, uh, we've been friends for a while. And um, before I met him, I found out that he liked rock, liked rock climbing. So I went rock climbing the weekend before we met on Monday and we had our call, which in reality it was a sales call because I was selling myself to write. And um, I went rock climbing and I asked him how his weekend is. Then he asked me mine. I said, oh, well, I went rock climbing. He was like, oh my God, I went rock. Like, I love rock climbing. And then we talk about rock climbing for 15 minutes. And then the trust barrier goes down. We're friends, we're getting along. And he's like, oh, let's talk about writing. And then he was like, oh my God, you have good content. This is great. Let's do some tests. And so I think that for me, um, it is uh, doing everything you can to differentiate yourself from the get-go. Like at the beginning of a call, like a lot of times a salesperson at the end of the call it has a, a thing where they're like, hello, this is John from this, where in reality, just tone changes like, hey, this is John, or hey, this is John. Like just the positivity of energy and like being excited can change. Um, so like that's a minimal change, but the the one that the Forbes example that I give you was um, you know it was more relationship or relationship based and being different in connection. So like I would say that that's like one that's going to take a lot more time for a big sale. And then the ones that when you're playing the numbers game, you got to do everything you can to remember that every sale matters, even if it is a number game, numbers game. Definitely, yeah, and, and building your it's not meant to be transactional. Yeah, you, you're ultimately after the transaction and the sale or an outcome, but ultimately if you focus on building the relationship and showing your customers or prospects that you can deliver that outcome, uh, then that's, that's a big win. I wanna dive into a little bit of the tactics. You talked about Cameo, you talked about sending gifts. I like this Cameo idea. I mean, I've, I've seen Cameo, but I've never used it. Oh, um, use it, man. You, you'll, I'll send you one just to mess with you. <laughs> yeah, so for everyone's benefit, if they've not heard of Cameo, Cameo is, uh, it, it is a tool that lets you pay celebrities to record a message for anyone. And I think it's a great way uh, to maybe figure out uh, through Twitter or social what prospects or people you're trying to reach out to, who, who they engage with, and then send them a cameo or a, or a greeting from that celebrity. And it's, it's fairly cheap, actually. It can be 10 to 100 bucks. 
right? Yeah. What's the last cameo you did? Like, walk us through that. What, who you're trying to connect with? Um, what cameo did you do? And then how did that okay. turn out? So you find out what the person's interest is. Like, you don't want to spend like, I, I, I did have a friend do Mike Tyson, which was expensive, a little more expensive for Mike Tyson. So I'm not saying you have to do that. But um, I'm trying to look at the one. Um, but ones that are the best ones aren't like the Tyson. They're like the, the biggest name ones. They're expensive and it's hard to, you know, uh, to make those work unless it's a super important relationship. The ones that are the best are find out their interests. Like, for example, if they went to Ohio State, find, or if they went to, um, yeah, like if you went to Ohio State, look in camo for who was a past athlete at Ohio, uh, at Ohio State. So if they have Buckeyes on something that they like shared out or excited about, the um football season get like the running back from i don't know i think eddie george might have went there or somebody like that but you know you get him to do that and say hey by the way you know you're ohio state fan as a buckeye you got to reach out to my friend john and so uh you know here's his contact info he wants to chat with you you know like that's something that like might not be expensive like an athlete that's retired you know years uh ozzy smith was like i just i think i just recommended using him to someone and he was like a hundred bucks and ozzy smith's one of the best baseball players in the history of st louis cardinals and so that was you know a hundred dollars but i mean you can get some really good ones between you know 20 and, and 70. definitely that sounds fantastic so what are all the tools you use day to day to stay top of mind uh, with people? Well, obviously I use my own tool. So I use calendar.com. So I'm biased there though. So uh, that's for sure. They're a, a disclosed bias. So I, I use that for keeping track of time, scheduling things, keeping track of time analytics. Um, I use uh, Mixmax for email um, follow-ups and things like that. I use, um, oh gosh, what else do I use on a regular basis? Cameo, obviously. Yeah, yeah that, use that. Um, I mean, those are two of the key ones that I do. Because uh, really, and so as crazy as it was, before we started calendar.com, I was going to start a thoughtful CRM about how you engage people to stay top of mind. And the reason why we couldn't, so we actually so we started developing and looking into it. The reason why we couldn't is because one of the barriers with being top of mind was people weren't managing their time well. So that was a whole, that's why I got brought into calendar uh, is that basically the biggest feedback we got is that if I had more time or was more organized or structured in my day, then I could be more thoughtful. So my goal, honestly, with calendar, like, like my business partner for calendar is never, um, I mean, he would, he would for sure admit to this is that like my goals down the road with calendar is to be able to be more thoughtful with reminders. The closest thing that I could think of that kind of was that way was like contactually was kind of like that. Uh, Relate IQ was kind of like that. But to me, there's still not a really, really good tool to stay top of mind. So for now, I would say it's, you know, combination between some sort of a to-do list or contextually uh, calendar.com and uh, Mixmax. Definitely. I think uh, I use Mixmax a lot as well uh, to reach out to people and so on. But like one of the key things I find is that people do business with people and in general, if, if you are at an event or meet somebody for the first time and walk away with one or two things you can connect them with and then keep them in your mind somewhere, so actively try to bring them together, connect them together, then that turns into the sort of stepping stone for a long lasting relationship. I have a great question here from Sandeep. How do you prioritize your time during the growth stage when detailing is as important as the big picture and both end up demanding significant bandwidth, hence little time for family or your own passion. Yeah. So this is something that I do is that prioritizing time. So time investment versus value. So from a standpoint of you put time on one and you put value on the other. So like speaking, for example, like well, this is with just with my time, but you can apply this differently. So speaking is something that it takes a lot of my time, um, but the value is significant. The problem is it takes so much of my time, but nobody else can do it unless like some other people on my team go up and can, and they're capable of speaking too, but I got to bring them up. Now there's other things like press and organic where like I have a, the, 
a firm that I were involved in, that's the one that will, uh, that I was mentioning earlier, like they can take care of that stuff. So I should be less focused on that because I can pay or put resources towards it. And it takes less of my time. Now it costs money, but people have to be re like, you have to look at all. So map it out, draw this out on like a basically up and down time value, and then also put cost to it. And so, um, and then move these things like over time, video marketing, you know, that would take more time, but that will move down as we find a better firm to use their podcasts or things like that. So the goal is to move these things down here so you can spend more time on things up here that you're only you can do. And so that's kind of how I map things out in a way. So like for me, um, you know, to answer the question, when I'm prioritizing, I'm saying, what are things I'm only uniquely qualified to do and that bring the most value? And then how am I pushing everything else down where I can either hire someone to do it pay for it to, to be done. Um, or if it's just not past a certain amount of value, I just need to prioritize the other things more. For me, it's scheduling and time boxing. Most of the time, time boxing doesn't involve family and personal things because people think of time boxing as a business strategy. Um, I look at it as a life strategy. And so for to make more time for personal, your family, you have to allocate the time. And so um, schedule that out. Like right now, um, I'm trying to think which time, I, well, I have five to seven blocked off today for family. So five to seven today will be with family. I'll you know be with them and I won't be able to do work. Um, and so I would say that for my standpoint of prioritization, I do that kind of graph I just showed you, but then I automatically schedule time within the week and every single day to allocate towards family. I have to be okay with that. Um, and then also what I do is I put a line um, uh, you know, I'm, I put a line and I basically cross it out here. And then everything that I didn't, that I got done, that was super important. I put above. Um, and then if I, anything below that line, I need to be okay with moving it to the next day and giving myself a break to hang out with family and friends. What do you wish looking back? What do you wish you did more of? And what do you wish you did less of? Um, I mean, honestly, uh, more i mean i think which i did more of is like and i and i've done this now is that getting um viruses out of my life so anybody who's bringing you down any friends that uh or people or what like get rid of them there might be short-term pain like this year there was somebody who who has been somewhat cut out of my life which was very sad initially but like in the long term i'm gonna be so much better off um and so i think that um, that, that's hard to do a lot of times where, you know, you don't cut viruses from your life um, either because of short-term pain or you, you know, don't want to. But I think that that's something I, I wish I would have done at a very early age is just been like, hey, I'm okay with, you know, not doing that, even though I might miss something in the short term. In the long term, I'm going to be better off because for me, I need to be around people I trust uh, that are loyal, that are thoughtful, that want, to, that want the people around them to be better and work with them. And so if you don't meet those criteria at this point in my life, you will not be around me. I won't be around you. And like, I'll help you occasionally. I might like, you know, do a quick favor or help or look out for you. But um, to be actually in my circle of, you know, relationships or people I work with, um, it needs to meet those uh, criteria. And so I, I strongly would recommend, you know, get yourself in a position, even though, even if it's short-term sacrifice. Sounds good. And what do you wish you did more of? I wish I would have given myself more breaks, honestly, early on. Like, I wish I would have, like, I went straight from work, from from being a student. Like, I never went on a spring break when I was in college. Then I worked the whole time. Then I never took a break there. Then after jobs, I've never, I've always started. The day that I sold out of my last company, we started and acquired a new company a day later. And so I would say that um, giving myself more breaks, I wish I would have and been okay with that. Um, cause I think that, you know, I'm 36 now, I'm not too old, but like, it's still, I wish I would have been able to experience certain times and, you know, reflected on a certain accomplishment and, and done that. So I, in hindsight, I wish I would have been better on that. Yeah. I think uh, taking breaks, deliberate breaks and shutting off, uh, helps you reset and helps you also be more creative. Uh, it's easy to get in the grind, but thank you so much, John. I learned a ton. There are two frameworks there on the time management piece and building relationship piece that I think I'll take away. I mean, stuff that uh, we're doing anyway at, uh, at Boast and Traction, but making it deliberate and sharing with our team members saying this is how you keep people top of mind is, is fairly valuable. Uh, it was great. Great being here, man. You guys are, it's good company. You're a good person. So thanks for having me.
I need some traction. 